All right, everyone, it looks like we have a lot of people signed up and are logged into the webinar. So we are going to go ahead and get started. So today we are going to be talking about landscaping for birds. Um, and we are at the Missouri River Bird Observatory. Uh, I have a couple of pictures here to start with of a couple of native plants and we'll get to those later. But first I wanna talk about who we are as the Missouri River Bird Observatory. So we are the Missouri River Bird Observatory or MERBO for short. Uh, we work to promote conservation of birds through scientific research bird population monitoring, policy advocacy, education and outreach efforts. Um, and these efforts all fit into four overarching categories depicted in the eggs below of quality habitats, feeding the flock, bird friendly communities and people in nature. To find out more about us and this stuff, you can check our website at www.merbo.org. So today um, we will have four presenters of our staff Paige Wittick is our education coordinator. She'll be talking about some of the how with the landscaping for birds today. And Dana, our director, will follow her talking more about the why and specific things that have worked in her experience. Ethan, our co-director, will also be joining um, probably to chime in about that time. And then lastly, I'm Zeb Yoko. I'm our conservation science communicator. I will start off this presentation here and kind of host as we go through. So which brings me to the technical notes. So we are recording this as a webinar on Zoom. Um, and as a webinar, we can't see you as the attendees, but we can um, get some of your interaction and feedback through the chat and Q&A functions. So somewhere on your screen, you should have, it's either on mine, it's usually at the bottom, but sometimes at the top of the menu, you have a, a, a drop down bar that has a couple of the different functions. So there should be Q&A, chat and raise hand. Um, if you have any questions, we'll answer questions at the end. You can put them in the Q&A chat uh, or the Q&A box that is going to be easier for us to manage than the chat box. If you have any general comments or other concerns or any technical issues, you can use the chat box to get a hold of us. Um, again, so we'll probably hold the Q&A till the end. We won't answer questions, but you can type them in freely as you come up with them. And then I believe Dana said that we she will be using the raise hand function. So you should hopefully find that one too while we are just getting started here. Um, any other notes? Um, this is going to be recorded and we will put it up on our website, also at merbo.org, and then it'll be on our YouTube page as well. So lastly, I think that's all I've got for the technical notes and I've introduced everybody. So I'm gonna go starting the presentation on kind of the de depressing part. So I got the depressing part this time, talking a little bit about the doom and gloom and why we are here to do landscaping for birds. Okay, so Habitat loss is a major challenge for many species and fragmentation from land conversion to agriculture and urbanization reduces abundance and diversity of native species like our birds. So grassland birds in particular are one that are, are a group of birds that are in steep decline. Um, and this finding was illustrated by a team of researchers affiliated with Cornell Lab of Ornithology um, in their findings. And the, their findings are hosted on 3billionbirds.org it's a study that's, that said there's basically 3 billion birds that are just missing from North America at this point. And grassland birds are one of the hardest hit birds and they are, um, they're typical of our region. But overall as a whole, migratory birds have, have also met declines. Um, many of the migratory birds have about a 28% decline over, across all the species over the last 50 years. So it's the problem that affects many different birds in our area, and a lot of it is due to habitat restraints. Um, one of those is suburban lawns and urbanization. Um, as I hinted before, urbanization and the concrete surfaces you can see, and then these um, suburban lawns are major drivers for habitat loss. There are millions of square miles of both. I can't remember when these stats are from, but there's just millions of square miles of suburban lawns and pavement. Um, sprawling across the, the United States. So in addition to land conversion for agriculture, these lawns are a major factor contributing to habitat loss. And so I've got some mind-blowing stats here a little bit. So in fact, um, lawns are more, um, there's more land that is irrigated or cropped as turf lawns than there is even for corn in a single year. And so I want to clarify, this study was published in 2005. So these numbers may have changed a little bit, but probably not for the better. Um, and it's not like there's not more lawns than there are row crops as a whole, but any one crop year by year, there's more lawns than say just corn, which is the most abundant row crop. So like it's not more than corn, soy, and wheat combined, but any individual one of those, there's more land that's used for lawns than, than that, which is mind blowing. 
And typical lawn grass has no ecological benefit and wastewater and space and can harbor lots of toxins from pesticides and fertilizers. So it's really, they're really ecologically bad news. Um, I also wanted to point out that most lawn grasses, even if they're called something like Kentucky bluegrass, are non-native species. Most of these are from Europe or Asia that have been introduced into the United States. Um, and then I also wanted to say that it's not just a thing for grasses. Um, Canadian night crawlers are another example. We, we do this a lot where we try and normalize something that's from that's been introduced into the area. So Canadian night crawlers are actually another species from uh, not anywhere in North America. They're not from Canada, but it's just a, a nice name for them to make you feel like they're more like they're supposed to be here. So it's kind of a big important thing and a, a major concern. And what we're gonna get to throughout this talk is talking about native plants because native plants harbor native bugs which harbor bird food. And so that'll be the main reason we're talking about landscaping. And in addition to that, even small scale restoration, which is, you know, that's you landscaping can help. And fortunately there are many resources and organizations out there to help you figure out what to do and how to do it. So we'll include some of those throughout this webinar and I'll put all the links on this webinar's page on our website. Um, so I'm not gonna get into the details of specific sources right now because my lovely other presenters are going to have some more information and have more specific examples. But hopefully through this talk, you will learn something useful to help you landscape and bring birds like these into your yard. And maybe someday you'll be able to take photos like these for future photo contests that we do. So these are actually photos from um, our friends and family that have submitted them for our photography contests in past years. and. They've been, obviously these are backyard birds and they were in a wonderful backyard. So hopefully you can learn something from this. And right now I'm going to stop my share and let Paige take it away. All right, thank you Zeb. <laughs> um, so great information from Zeb. And so, yeah, so now I'm Paige Wittick. I'm just gonna start my slideshow here. And so what I'm going to talk about with you guys is how to go about starting your creating your bird oasis. So like Zeb talked about, um, your lawn can create really important habitat for these birds. And what we often talk about too is when you're creating habitat for birds, you're creating habitat for a lot of other native species as well. And so what is the best way to go about creating your bird oasis? Plant native plants! Woohoo! Um, so I can narrow it down to two words, <laughs> um, and you may have heard this before, um, and a lot of native plants, well, I don't want to say a lot of, um, sometimes native plants get the reputation of being quote unquote weeds, um, but I, we like to point out that there are over 1500 flowering plants in Missouri, and they're really cool, and I'm going to go, we'll go over some of those different examples of ones, um, but we'll get started. <laughs> Um, with kind of how you're going to go about planting native and why that's important. So first off, what is a native plant? So I took two def definitions from different resources I found that I think um, explain it well in kind of a different way. So um, the NRCS defines it as a plant that is a part of the balance of nature that has developed over hundreds or thousands of years in a particular region or ecosystem and that you can always use a geographic qualifier in that. So for example, these plants that we're gonna be talking about are not only native plants to the United States, but are native plants um, particularly to Missouri. Um, so, and that only plants found in this country before European settlement are considered to be native to the United States. Um, another definition that I thought kind of ties into more what we're talking about today from the National Wildlife Federation is, Native plants have formed a symbiotic relationship with native wildlife over thousands of years and therefore offer the most sustainable habitat. A plant is considered native if it has occurred naturally in a particular region, ecosystem, or habitat without human introduction. So it's a plant that was here before Europeans were here, essentially, and that over through thousands of years, that plant has evolved with the soil, the moisture, everything in that ground, um, and the weather and therefore evolved with the insects and the birds. Um, so they just um, 
all work together in an ecosystem. So what I think part of what I think is really cool about planting native is your yard comes alive. Um, it becomes a part of that ecosystem. Also, there are a lot of other great benefits to planting natives. Um, so a big thing is that they require less maintenance than some non natives. So they, like I said, they thrive in the soils, most moisture and weather of your region. They require less supplemental watering. You will probably have to water them um, to get them established, but once they're established, they should require a lot less water than those non native species. Um, they also have less, they can have less pest problems that would require less um, toxic chemicals, um, such as um, pe uh, pesticides that you would need to put out in your yard. Um, and they also can assist in managing rainwater runoff. Um, and that part of that is because they can also hold and maintain that healthy soil as their root systems are so deep and keep soil from becoming compacted. So looking at this um, diagram um, on this slide, you can see like there's some non-native species and how deep their roots go. And then you look at these native plants and how deep their roots go, a lot deeper. Um, and so that helps hold in that soil. It helps absorb, absorb more moisture. So you're really, there's just a lot of benefits, not only to birds and insects, but also to the land that you're planting them on. So let's go over some of the different things that research shows. So more bird species, more bird species and greater number of birds occur in areas with native vegetation. Nests have better protection from predators like cats and raccoons, because when you're planting native, you're typically having those multiple layers of growth. And so there's more areas for those birds to um, go and hide um, and plant their nests in something that's more secure. Insects prefer native host plants. And I just found today um, that there was a study that showed that non-native plants reduce the diversity of insect populations in gardens, even where the non-native plants are closely related to the native plants. So sometimes we have non-native species that are very closely related to the native species that were here. Um, but it shows that even when they're closely related, those um, native plants really have a much higher diversity of the insect population as well as um, it, it, as well as possibly more of an abundance. <laughs> um, and so also I thought what was really interesting is native wildflowers can often provide more nectar for hummingbirds. Um, and may, many native species can provide food throughout the year. So not only in the spring and summer, but also in the fall. Um, and seeds during the winter. <laughs> so this is just to kind of show you again, native plants support native insects. Um, that's gonna be a big theme of this presentation. Just like at that bottom of Zeb's, Zeb's mind blowing slide, he writes, native plants equals native insects equals native birds. <laughs> so another, so we talk about those insects. And so I think this was, this was provided by the Missouri Prairie Foundation and they have this, um, that the number of butterfly and moth species supported by these different plants. So native oaks can support over 500 different species. Native cherries and um, plums, 429. Native asters, 105 species supported. Non-native boxwood for Cynthia and butterfly bush, one species. Non-native daylilies, hostas, and lily turf, zero species. So looking at those native species, um, they support a lot more butterfly and moth species. So again, your yard is going to become alive with different insects and different birds. So when we're thinking about birds specifically, so if you're a bird, how are you looking at habitat? How are you looking at a piece of land and determining that's where I want to go live? <laughs> so they're looking at food and water. So that's a big of what we're talking about with native plants. That's what we're talking about with food. Um, but also water sources. So you could provide a bird bath or if you can have a natural, if you have a natural water source nearby, that can be really great too. Um, they're looking at spots to see if they can nest or roost there. Um, so kind of looking at like shrub, more shrubby type habitats and vegetation structure and type. So are, am I a grassland bird? Am I a forest bird? Um, and looking at what that structure is and what I need and what type of nest I make and does that vegetation structure and type support those things. So another big thing. So birds, especially, well, 
we're kind of nearing the end of um, nesting season right now, um, but some birds still definitely are. And nestlings need insects. They need a lot of insects. So 96% of nesting birds feed insects to their young. So even species um, like cardinals that mainly eat seeds as adults will feed insects to their young. Um, so for example, to raise one nest of chickadee babies, so we're talking like, I think the max number that chickadees will have is eight um, nestlings in a nest. I think the minimum is probably like three or four. Um, and so to feed that nest of babies, it takes, it can take up to 9,000 caterpillars to feed them over a period. I believe their nestling period is probably around two weeks. <laughs> So that's a lot of caterpillars that those parents have to find in a very short amount of time. <laughs> um, and so native plants nourish these caterpillars that these young nestlings need. So if your yard has these caterpillars, um, uh, it it's a lot better habitat for these birds to come nest there. Um, and there are 500 different kinds of caterpillars that can feed on oak trees. So I think that's pretty significant to know too. So first steps, how you're going to go about it. So you're gonna assess your habitat type, prairie, wetland, forest, glade. And Dana's gonna go into this more with more detail if you're like, what? I don't even know how to go about that, so don't worry. <laughs> and then you'll want to mimic the multiple layers of growth. Um, so Dana will kind of go over that with you too, but just kind of thinking about, okay, my essentially just like short plants, shrubby plants, maybe some trees, if you're looking at more of a forest um, type habitat. You're also going to want to select plants that will provide berries, seeds, nuts, and insects. <laughs> so kind of what we've been talking about already. So essentially plants that provide the things that birds eat. <laughs> um, and then consider the different flowering times to provide food for more, a longer portion of the year. And some fun things that you can do that require less work, uh, create a brush pile to provide shelter. So take up all those sticks in your yard, throw them in a pile, and that's actually really great for birds. Um, they love that, particularly in the winter when you have some of your like the ground foraging sparrows. <laughs> also, you can leave some leaf litter on the ground. That helps um, in a variety of ways. Um, and yeah, and you don't have, if you're allowed to do that, because um, I know some homeowners associations aren't really big on that. But if you can, leave your leaf litter and that can really help support the birds as well. Another big thing that you'll want to do is limit your use of pesticides and herbicides. Um, I'm sure you've probably heard kind of about this issue before, that they can be ingested by birds as they feed on the insects and plants that have been treated by those things, and they kind of get um, secondary poisoning from those. And so it's kind of the same thing with rodenticides. So if you um, do have a rodent problem and you're trying to put out different things we recommend live traps but if you you want to make sure that it's enclosed so because what can happen is that rat or that mouse will ha ingest that poison they become disoriented and they become even easier prey for those um, birds of prey out there so they ingest that poison and it can bioaccumulate and um, really hurt those birds so you want to be really careful with what you're putting on your plants um, to protect from insects um, and different things like that, as well as um, what you're putting out there to um, prevent rodents. <laughs> so other ways to attract birds. And I'm not going to go into these super deep um, because there are some other resources that even we have out there that go into each of these things a little bit more. Um, one of those is bird feeders. Um, that can be really fun, um, particularly in the winter um, when there's a little bit less food available. Um, putting out a water feature. Um, so that can be as simple as what I did, which was fill up a dish with water and put it outside. <laughs> or you can have a bird bath, or you can have, you know, some sort of like, if you really want to get fancy with it, fountain with a pond can be really cool too. <laughs> um, nest boxes are another thing. Um, and I highly recommend if you're looking at doing nest boxes, looking into a lot of the resources that are out there, because there's a lot of information to get you started. And then another big thing is you'll want to keep cats indoors. So cats are a non-native predator um, and they can, I mean, yeah, they, <laughs> they're out there and they're not doing birds any favors. Um, so you'll want to keep those inside and that's actually really good for your cat as well. Um, so, uh, but I think it's important to point out that if you do mimic these natural structures and there's a cat in your area, that isn't your cat that you can't control, 
providing these different multiple layers of growth can help the birds be protected from that outdoor cat that you maybe not have control over. Um, so I think that's an important point to make too. Okay, so to end, reasons to plant native. There's so many, um, but these are just a couple of them. So for a sense of place, um, planting native really brings you to the heritage of what used to be there. Um, it also can be really beautiful and really fun to plan out your new yard. Um, Stormwater management. So like I said, they're deep roots, so they're going to absorb more of that water. For educational opportunities, so you can bring kids out there and show them the different native plants and the insects that are on those plants. For erosion control, so again, it keeps that soil um, there um, and it's less compacted, so it can help things grow better. They're less maintenance, so they're going to require that less water. Um, and like um, herbicides and pesticides and fertilizers, they're going to require less of those things. And you're also creating wildlife habitat, which is probably why you attended today. So a lot of great reasons to plant native. Now, if you're thinking about how do I get started with knowing what native plants are, don't worry. Dana is going to help get you guys started with that. But another great way um, to learn more is this book is called Bringing Nature Home um, by Doug Talmy. And it really lays out kind of what we're talking about, which is like native plants, native insects, um, and habitat for birds and other wildlife. So that's all I have. And we'll, don't worry, we'll bring up much more resource or many more resources. There are a lot out there. So um, we'll cover those as well. But I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Dina, who's gonna talk to you more about things. <laughs> All right, I need to unmute myself. Can you all hear me? Okay, very good. Okay. So good evening, everyone. Um, thank you to Zeb and to Paige for kind of setting the stage. I'm gonna get into a little bit more specifics, but as Paige mentioned, there are 1,500 um, flowering plants in Missouri, many of them are extremely beautiful. One thing that I noticed when I started getting into um, planting with natives is to sort of wonder why people would have replaced our natives with ornamentals um, that are introduced from elsewhere because we have got a lot of incredible native plants. So as I think that Zeb and Paige both um, made a good point of any and every bit of habitat counts. We've had so much habitat loss um, that birds and butterflies and other critters are, are really suffering from. Um, your yard does matter, like it, it genuinely does. And so there are several different programs. Um, one of my favorites is the National Wildlife Federation's um, Certified Wildlife Habitat um, Program, where you basically, you can sign up online, tell the details about your yard, um, and there's a variety of sizes that they accept, everything from very, very small and on upward. And um, you will get a nice sign and you will have a wildlife certified yard. So I recently learned that um, NWF also expanded this program to um, faith organizations. So this is something that um, you know, churches, synagogues um, can get involved in as well, which I thought was really neat because that's more of a community outreach effort as well as an individual yard uh, program. So I just wanted to bring that up. So that is their philosophy as well. Every bit of habitat counts. So a little bit about Missouri's birds and here's kind of some numbers for you. So I like to think about if a bird's here year round, what does it eat? If it's only here during breeding season, Paige brought up that almost every species feeds an abundance of insects to their young. Um, what do birds eat in winter? Are kind of tough wintering birds that are here, what, what, is, what is helpful to them? And then definitely migration. So um, a lot of folks know about migration or have seen our previous webinar on this topic. And it's, a, it's an amazing feat that requires a lot of energy. So the more that we as individuals and you know, homeowners 
can provide some good food for these birds as they're making these hundreds of miles epic journeys, the, the better they're going to do, um, the more likely they are to survive and the better they're going to do when they get to their breeding grounds. So just to sort of reiterate a point, and Paige literally brought up a cardinal, um, we know this bird is a seed eater. Even our seed eaters and berry eaters really do need an abundance of insects um, during the breeding season. So I also pictured this uh, shrike, who is a, essentially a carnivore. Um, here are some of, some of our backyard birds. Um, by no means all, I just enjoy seeing um, a number of different colors. And clockwise from the top left, we have the Baltimore Oriole, um, the Rose-Breasted Grosbeak, Summer Tanager, Goldfinch, American Goldfinch down there on the bottom, Ruby-Throated Hummingbird, which just to, um, a bit of a side note, but we all think of them as nectar feeders and have um, sugar water essentially for them, which they do eat and use for energy, but they too are actually insect eaters as well. Um, and then Cedar Waxwing there. Um, on the bottom left. So a way to think about these um, is sort of in guilds about, you know, surrounding their favorite foods. So we have seed eaters and fruit and nectar eaters and insect eaters. And in all of these cases, and these are just very rough categories, in all of these cases, um, there's a little bit of sort of food specialization um, so we have seed eaters. I chose the American goldfinch and this lovely picture um, because this is this species is an interesting case where they actually breed quite a bit later than most of our species. They breed around now and in early August when a lot of prairie plants are going to seed because even during their breeding season, while they are feeding their young insects, seeds are still a really, really important part of their diet. So they've, their breeding timing actually reflects that. Um, so fruit and nectar eaters, um, berries, there's a, a, a pokeweed there on the, on the right, a very common um, Missouri native plant that produces berries. Um, Ethan, who you'll hear from later, makes me have many of these in the yard, even though they get really messy, just saying. Um, and then we have many different types of vines as well. So... And then all insect eaters, of course, we've talked about this, but insect eaters particularly benefit from native plants as Paige um, described to y'all. So I know that one of the toughest things I think is for folks that were primarily vegetable gardeners to really embrace insects in their garden. Um, but when you do, you get cool critters like this, beautiful birds that eat them like this, and then um, butterflies like this. So even though I, I, I both uh, vegetable garden and do kind of habitat restoration via native plants, and yes, we do have some insects in our vegetable garden, it's true. It's really worth it for the amount of diversity that we're able to support. So here's an example. Um, this is a uh, slate colored junco. Lots of folks know this as a snowbird. Um, this is one of our wintering birds. And this is a junco feeding on um, dogwood berries when it's here in the late fall, early winter. So I just wanted to kind of throw this up there. And, you know, this is the sort of information that's going to be available to you in all of the resources um, that uh, Paige or Zeb are going to put in the chat. We'll have it on our website as well. So I'm not suggesting you write this all down right now. Um, but Paige mentioned the importance of thinking about timing because in a lot of cases, particularly with our ornamentals, um, they all go to flower at relatively similar times. Um, whether or not they're truly fruit producing is another matter. So when you're kind of planning out your garden, um, think about everything from just basically the entire year, right? So, um, and then flowering times, spring all the way into, in some cases, early fall when um, the plants fruit when they go to seed. Because if you start thinking about it that way, you're able to genuinely provide food for birds throughout the year, whether they're um, fruit preferring birds, seed preferring birds, um, and of course our insect eaters as well. So this is a 
as folks I'm sure know, it's a pretty vast oversimplification of habitats in Missouri, but it's also an easy way to get started with the idea of what would my historic landscape have looked like. And so I'm gonna escape for one second. If y'all bear with me, I need to get some zoom things out of my way <laughs> so I can see my own slides better. Okay, so, um, Prairies to savannas. So savannas are essentially a prairie that has um, less than, it. it's a very specific habitat type, typically an oak savanna. It has um, a very low amount of tree cover, but it is a little different than a prairie. So a prairie is something like that pictured here. Um, this is actually down in Pettis County. Prairies, as anyone knows that spends any time in them, are subject to very extreme conditions um, from extremely wet at times to very dry, full sun. Paige showed you a picture of some of the root structure um, in different prairie plants were, were pictured in that. Um, and that rich soil structure is maintained by plants and by microorganisms that are in close relationships with those native plants. Um, so traditionally, historically, um, this habitat was maintained via wildfires and, and grazing by native herbivores. Um, so if you take a prairie and you leave it alone and you never disturb it by, by burning it or grazing it, eventually you will get shr a shrubland and eventually um, you will get some sort of tree structure and, and more of a forest condition depending on the soil type. Um, so one of the, the organizations that Paige brought up as far as data is the Missouri Prairie Foundation. Um, and this is actually, the, this picture here is actually a prairie where they do work and maintaining a prairie is no small feat. So um, it takes a, quite a lot of management. Um, and I'm not suggesting that you're gonna, you know, put 400 acres out like this picture. Um, but we do in our own yard, we have a small prairie planting, and I mean it's small, this is just right near our house, and we actually burn it um, at least every other year. So, um, woodlands, folks are typically more familiar with a woodland habitat. Um, it's got, obviously it's got canopy trees, it's got organic soil, um, and the flower and fruiting time is, is very shade dependent. So one of the things that struck me as interesting is when someone said to me that the term green up, like in the spring when people say, oh, things are greening up, that really came from, from woodlands, from forests, because the greening up starts on the, on the forest floor and works its way up, and it's the canopy trees that, that leaf out and become green last. And you can imagine if they leafed out and became green first, things wouldn't grow very well and green up on the, on the forest floor. Um, wetlands, so this is again a very, very, very simplified broad category, um, but essentially they're inundated at some points during the year. They have water tolerant plants. Um, there are sort of different levels of wetlands, so there's some that stay, parts in low elevation that stay wet most of the year, and we like to say that those plants like to have their feet wet all the time, um, all the way up to sort of um, secondary bottoms that are underwater less time. Um, so there's a lot of different variables here, but I'm one of the things is that you can you can determine what your what your yard would have been, what your area would have been. But also a lot of our all, pretty much all of our native plant vendors here in Missouri will say that this is you know a wetland species or a prairie species or a forest species. So knowing what you're looking for, and I've made the mistake of not doing this properly, and I'll get to that. <clears throat> so, um, so I would guess that there are probably some people on this webinar right now that have been gardening way longer than I have. Um, they may know more about native plants than I do. So I just want to share kind of my experience and, and some of the plants that we've worked with um, here at our own home. So this is a little side view um, of Ethan's in my home and our gardens when we, when we moved to this house 12 years ago were purely ornamental, purely exotic introduced species. And we've been like slowly trying to convert things to native. Um, you can see 
we have a little bit of help with grazers, um, but that is a, a mimosa tree um, that can be very invasive actually. And so we didn't, we didn't put that there. Again, we're trying to replace things with natives, but it's a, it's a slow process even in just our yard that surrounds our house. Um, so we live outside of Marshall. You can see that a little bit left of center there. Um, and our, the MRBO office is in Arrow Rock and that's where Paige is right now. But so we're in Saline County and we're in a little bit of the borderlands kind of between the prairies in the north part of Missouri that were essentially created by glaciation um, and, and the foothills of the Ozarks. So here outside of Marshall, we actually have a city park that is called Indian Foothills Park. And the reason Foothills is in there is because it's, 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 they're still low hills, but it's the beginning of the Ozarks. So we're in a little bit of a transition zone. Um, much of the county would have been prairie um, but we do also have a lot of rivers and streams in our watershed. And so there would have been lower, you know, forest riparian zones um, and then sort of an interface between those things. So in a way we're lucky because it's very variable and, and naturally very diverse. Um, so what that has meant is that in our, our own property, we have been careful and made mistakes in choosing different plants for our different soil types, our different exposures, and, and what would have would have been here historically. So I'm not going to get into this part of things, um, but we have a uh, seven or so acre native prairie restoration. Um, I think Ethan will get into that a little bit next week um, when we have a webinar that's actually on restoration of like larger scales. I'm just going to focus on on things in our backyard right now. Um, so this is where I wanted to see if folks raise their, does anyone currently have any of these plants that they've, you know, put in or, or maintained? Um, so, oh, hands, 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 hands. That's awesome. A lot, so many. See, y'all are already native plant gardeners. Excellent, thank you. Thank you for raising your hands. Um, so these, I have another slide with a few more plants as well. These are not all of the native plants we put in, but these are some of my favorite. Um, I just, I'm gonna touch on a few of them. And again, just kind of share my own experiences a little bit. Um, so American Beautyberry, and this information that you see is what should be taken into consideration when you're assessing your own yard and, and planting accordingly. So I need to admit that when we first started converting to native plants, I essentially went to native plant sales and bought things that I thought were cool and put them around without, you know, doing this plan of, of you know, what side of the house is is this exposure and what exactly are our soil types and um, when we went to do the larger restoration of prairie of course we thought about those things but here on the yard i just went and bought stuff that i thought was cool and sometimes it didn't work out and sometimes it worked out wonderfully um, and requires very little maintenance so um, our american beauty berry is very healthy one thing that's amazing to me about this plant is every year i'm like is it not alive anymore? Because it takes a really long time to leaf up. And I don't know if everyone experiences that, um, but we have it in a nice spot, kind of in partial sun near a water feature um, and birds in the fall love this, love the berries of this plant. Um, Columbine, this is probably one of the most familiar native plants to folks. And um, it is incredibly prolific here. Um, we've gone from, a little bit of columbine to tons and tons and tons of columbine, which is great. One thing I really like about it is that it flowers very early. And so when the hummingbirds get here in the spring, um, it's a good food source for them when very little else is blooming at that time. Um, this is a plant that I'm particularly enamored with. I actually, I think that it took me three different times to get this to grow. Um, but the flowers are very, they're, they're small, delicate um, bells is what they look like. And I've had this conversation with a number of different people and it 
it is really supposed to be a shrub-like plant, but ours is more of a vine. It acts more like a vine. I'm not really sure why that is, but the flowers are exactly like this. Um, lots of, we see lots and lots of pollinators on our Fremont's leather flower flowers. All right, pull, pull two. Um, raise your hand if you have any of these plants. I bet there's, yeah, I bet there's. All right, that's awesome. Lots and lots. Very good. Very good. Okay, these are, um, you know, another just kind of group of favorites of mine that we have planted and been successful with around here. Um, so this is interesting. And if anybody knows anything about this that's in the audience and wants to comment on it, um, we were talking about this last night and I often see certainly the common names of these plants um, used, you know, one to mean the other all, all the time. But I have actually seen situations where even at a native plant sale, they're using the different scientific name, which always got me confused. Um, but the wild bergamot, Monarda fistulosa, um, is the one that I know of is most common. We have planted it in various places on purpose. It has come up after we have burned areas that hadn't been burned in a long time. Um, and so if anybody has a comment on that, that'd be great. But um, we again talked about it last night that the interchanging of these, the, the common names of these three plants is, it happens all the time. Um, this is a favorite. We, this did so well at our house. Um, and we constantly see butterflies um, and and bees and other pollinators on on this on this Joe pie weed. Um, so and this is one that is typically a wetland plant. It's kind of within our prairie planting, but it does get a lot of water. So and it also because it's within our our small planting that's in our yard, it actually gets burned pretty often too. But it always comes back and comes back stronger. Um, so this was mentioned also, um, particularly by Paige, that, you know, you don't have to have some big backyard. Um, there's a wonderful lot of things that you can do with layering in really small spaces. And I've even seen some pretty amazing examples of this in an apartment setting where someone had a, you know, a balcony and they just layered native plants and they would get hummingbirds and, and butterflies and, and bees as well. So don't think that you have to have some enormous, enormous space to be able to do this. So I just want to briefly go into butterflies because they're cool um, and just a few of them. And I think that sometimes, well, we do a lot on birds, so um, it's fun to give butterflies attention sometimes. Um, I also just wanted to honestly kind of boast about this. The, the, mo the moth on the upper left is a polyphemus moth and that's right on our back door um, a couple years ago. And so I've been getting personally more into moths particularly and also butterflies. We keep an iNaturalist, if anyone knows that app, I bet a lot of people on this do. Um, we keep an iNaturalist project called Back Porch Bugs. Um, and so on the upper right there is a snowberry clear wing and then on the bottom is a luna moth, which might be something that folks are familiar with there. I, I haven't personally seen those commonly, um, nor that polyphemus moth that's in the top left. The snowberry clear wing in the top right, we actually do get those somewhat regularly. Um, but just a few butterflies that you're probably going to have in your backyard if you have native plants. Um, the common buckeye. So you can see a little bit of information about it here. Um, they do migrate um, and they won't really overwinter here, um, but they're fairly abundant right now. Um, we just saw a couple yesterday. So just some neat pictures of their caterpillar and their chrysalis. Um, I'm not going to provide all of the life cycle information. I just think it's really neat to sort of look into the life cycles of butterflies and moths because they're just, they're so very different from, um, you know, the, the birds and mammals that we're typically familiar with. Eastern tiger swallowtail, another pretty familiar butterfly. 
So you can see there how many, they have quite a lot of host plants, um, trees. So Paige mentioned a lot about the different trees and, and how those support our native insects as well as birds. They do not migrate. Leave those leaves on the ground. You can see um, this is one of the many insect species that really likes leaf litter and needs leaf, needs leaf litter. So if you or anyone has a um, super clean, super sterile lawn, you're not, you're not helping these guys. Um, one neat thing about them, I thought, is that there's a dark morph of the female that looks a lot, oops, like pipe vine swallowtail. Sorry about that. That was also another um, Eastern tiger that has a dark morph. Um, spicebush swallowtail, hosted by spicebush, go figure on that, sassafras. We have a couple generations per year in Missouri, um, and some individuals of each generation will overwinter. These do not migrate. Um, I thought that it was interesting how they changed in appearance throughout their stages. So I just wanted to show that, that's pretty cool. Um, the Painted Lady, another familiar one. Um, these do migrate. Um, they're hosted by thistle and a, and a bunch of other plants. And you can see they're a very, very abundant um, butterfly. They're actually cosmopolitan. They exist in Africa and Europe as well, which I thought was super interesting. And then I just thought this was the greatest thing. So the National Weather Service in Boulder, Colorado, a few years ago, said, hey, you know, we think that this is birds because this is normally, I mean, we do, we pick up flocks of migrating birds on, on radar. People study it, birders use it to um, know when to go out and, and look for migrants the next morning. Um, but what this turned out to be is it was actually an enormous flight of this butterfly that showed up on National Weather Service radar. So I thought that was quite remarkable. And then finally, um, our monarch. Monarch is probably the most well-known North, butterf North American butterfly. I would guess lots of, lots of folks know that this butterfly needs milkweed. So the adults will get nectar for many, many, many different flowers, but the caterpillars eat milkweed. That is what they need. Um, there's many different species of milkweed, but they need to have some milkweed species. So this is a, a fairly well-known conservation plight story. Um, and essentially, the monarch's population has been declining and it's, it's basically due to um, a big loss of milkweed. And Paige mentioned a lot about kind of fertilizers and chemicals and these widespread chemicals are killing milkweed um, in, in great quantities. And so the monarch's been in trouble, but it's, there's good news, it's getting better. I'll get to that at the very end. Um, it has one of the most just fascinating life cycles of any, any critter I've ever heard of. Um, so adults are generally short lived, but the last generation migrates to Mexico and back. So this lovely fluttery thing that weighs like nothing makes this long distance flight. Um, I just wanted to show a couple close ups of the chrysalis of the monarch because they're just to me, one of the most amazing things in nature. Um, here's a sort of photographic series um, over time of the chrysalis being formed and then eventually the emergence of the adult butterfly. And so where they go when they, when they leave North America for the winter or leave the United States and Canada for the winter is they go down to um, Mexico in a, a habitat called the Oyamel fir, fir Forest. And so this is the kind of <laughs> wintering situation that the monarch butterfly that we know so well um, shows. And how their populations are counted and tracked is literally by how many acres of Oyamel fir trees the monarchs are gathered on. And that's, that's pretty much how we know how many they are. So you can see um, this is their, their trend, and this is in, this is in hectares, so um, a, a unit of area measurement, right? Um, so you can see there's been a decline, 
but we're not doing as badly as we were doing back in 2012, 2013, 14, 15. Um, and so you can pretty much put a line on here between when Roundup and other such chemicals really started being used in abundance and killed a bunch of milkweed and the butterflies decline. But then around 2012, 13, 14, people started really pushing native plants and home gardeners started planting milkweed and that has made an enormous difference. So um, there, are, there are projects where someone will put in a quarter acre of some milkweed and they'll have a bunch of monarchs and, and host caterpillars and host chrysalis and the monarchs will be able to reproduce. So um, an example of where we can make a big, huge difference. So some resources, and again, we'll be, don't feel like you just have to quick write this down. Grow Native, which is a project with the Missouri Prairie Foundation, awesome guides to um, Missouri vendors of native plants. So Audubon Society Native Plant Database, this one is really cool because you can actually say, I want to attract these birds and it'll help you figure out what plants would do that and if that's appropriate for your exact area. And kind of vice versa, you can look at plants and then look at what birds they would attract. The Missouri Department of Conservation is excellent for native plant resources. Missouri Native Plant Society. Um, the Missouri Botanical Garden also has excellent resources. I very much recommend them. Um, a Gardener's Guide to Missouri Chapter 4 is Landscaping with Native Plants, particularly. 